Okay, so I think we'll start now. Um, I think that person is busy joining. Um, so we're starting. So this lesson is on the weighted average cost of capital. Um, we're just going to focus the first 30 minutes maximum on high level theory. And so just the basic principles and then a way of approaching a WAC question. And then we're going to spend the next 60 minutes on tackling a WAC question. The WAC question we're going to be tackling is um, October, November um, 2020, Max 3702 final exam. It is question two, say, think about 20 more questions, 15, 20 more questions. Um, although it is a third year level, the same thing is going to be tested in, in postgrad. What may, or just maybe in a more complex scenario, but I'm not, I didn't want to take a complex scenario because you're doing a read for three hours, which is going to be too much. So I should look for a question that is on a CTA level, but I have not much of a reading. So I just want to give you the high level way of thinking and the principle and show you how to actually go about answering it. So just keep that in mind. So we're doing MAC 3702, October, November 2020, the final exam. Now, the purpose of WAC, WAC is a big, big topic within financial management and hence within the MAC course. Remember, the purpose of WAC or what WAC actually is, it is just basically a cost of finance to a business. So WAC is the cost of finance to a business. So let's just think about this. Let's say you take out a, a, a home loan. You want, to buy a, you want to buy a house and you take out a bond. The cost of the house, the cost of finance for the house would be the, 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 the bond rate. Now, similarly for a business, they not only, they, they're gonna invest by, they invest into new companies. They're gonna invest by expanding into new um, geographical areas. They're gonna um, invest by expanding into new product lines and so forth. In order to fund all of these long-term investments, they need money, they need funding. So they're going to find funding in one of two ways, through debt or through equity. So although, in, um, let's say they invest through, in a new product line, they may, take, they may finance that product line only through equity. Then they decide, okay, they're going to Australia. That funding may be funded through, um, may be funded through um, uh, debt. So even though a specific project will be funded through a specific form of finance, when we work out the cost of finance, we don't base it on the specific finance, but we rather base it on the average finance, um, average finance cost to a business. And that is basically what, what WAC is. What is the cost of finance to a business over its long-term period? So you might just be very, very careful about that. They're gonna test you without you knowing um, to ask you what is WAC. You must know WAC is the cost of finance, the average cost of finance to a business over a long, uh, over, over a long term. That means it is the weighting, the weighting between debt and equity finance, irrespective if a particular project is funded through one particular source of finance. That's extremely, extremely important. They're gonna give you an option. They're gonna say, dear Faid, this company has invested in a new project. They're expanding to Australia. In order to fund the expansion to Australia, they took out debt finance of 15%. Please, indicate to the, to the CEO of the company what the most appropriate cost of finance should be. And then you must tell them, is it the 15% of the specific loan finance or is it the weighted average cost of capital? And then why? Very, very, very important. That is a fundamental principle. If you get that wrong, they'll mark your whole thing wrong. So just keep that in mind. Same way in accounting. If you, if you get a fundamental principle in accounting wrong, they're going to mark the rest of the question wrong. So 
So the same thing over here. That's a fundamental principle. So please keep that in mind. So that is what WACI is. It is the average, it is the cost of finance for a business over a long, uh, over, uh, over the long term. Why is WAC so important? WAC indicates to a company whether they are making a profit or whether they're making a loss, whether they're creating value or whether they are destroying value. So they, will, they want to expand into Australia. They estimate that, they, that the, the return on investment in Australia will be 20%. If the cost of, of finance for the business is more than the return of 20%, they shouldn't go there. But if it is less, they can go there because then they'll be generating finance. So that gives a company an indication as to whether an investment is, a, is generating rewards that exceed their cost. That's number one. Number two, in, finance, in accounting, it is used extensively, okay? And then number three, it is also used extensively in, in valuations. So the WAC rate is very, very important because it helps you determine whether an investment is viable or not. It helps you to determine the fair value when you perform a valuation, and it helps you to determine the correct numbers or the correct fair value from a financial reporting point of view. So this is going to be critical in CTA 2. Um, some of you are in CTA 2, where um, you must be able to, to, to see the bigger picture, see how things interlink between each other. So where is the link of WAC with financial reporting too? One of the most common places, going to be fair value, but one of the most common places is IAS 36, which is impairment. When you determine impairment, you have to determine the recoverable amount. The recoverable amount is the lower of, oh, sorry, the recoverable amount is the higher of value in use and fair value less cost to sell. Now in the value in use calculation, in the value in use calculation, we use the WAC rate. So that's also why it's so important. So just keep in mind the importance of WAC, it is used in different areas within a business. It, used, it is used extensively in, in valuations. It is used in making a decision as to whether you should ex, um, um, expand or not, go into a, a, um, uh, invest into a new project or not. And then number three, there's only three of, of many other reasons. It is, uh, it, uh, um, it's used in financial reporting, accounting. So that is the importance. So, it's, so we discuss what is WAC. WAC is a cost of finance, to a business over a long-term period. Remember, it is the general cost of finance. Then number two, why it's important, we said it is used extensively in valuations. It is used to help you make a decision whether you should make an investment or not. And it is used um, in financial reporting. So you need to know these stuff. Now comes the meat of weighted average cost of capital. How do you actually calculate WAC? Now, to see a bigger picture, what you must understand in determining the weighted average cost of capital, we need three things. We only need three things, nothing more. We only need three things. That three things then will be dissected into many different things. But what is the three things that we need? Number one, <clears throat> you need to determine or you need to identify the components of capital, very important. Number two, once you have the component of capital, then you can do step two and step three. Step two and step three can be done in any order. I just follow one way. So step two would be calculate the market rates, the cost of finance. And then number three is to calculate the weighting. So what's the three things? Number one, identify the components of capital. Number two, determine the market rates. Number three, calculate or determine market, calculate the weightings. So just keep that in mind. Now let's go on to step one. Step one is determine or, or identify your components of capital. What are your components of capital? Your components of capital is the capital structure. Okay, so your components of capital is the capital structure of the business. 
A company's capital structure is made up of all its long-term finance. And a company's long-term finance is made up of debt and equity. So just keep that in mind. Now, which debt? It is all your long-term interest-bearing debt. Which equity? It is all equity. Your typical examples would be as follows. For equity, your typical examples are ordinary share capital, as well as preference share capital. The typical examples of um, the typical examples of debt would be long-term loans, debentures, preference shares, and bonds. Now, what you notice, preference shares could either be debt or equity as a general rule, not an always rule, a general rule. Um, preference shares would be equity if it is non-redeemable, and preference shares would be debt if it is redeemable. Redeemable means there is a specified date of repayment. Non-redeemable means there's no specified date of repayment. So just keep that in mind. So that is number one, identify the components of capital. What did we say? Components of capital is your capital structure, which is made up into a long-term finance, and all long-term finance is debt or equity, and debt or equity is only your long-term interest-bearing debt, and then all equity. Now that you have your long, now that you have identified your components of capital, now you can go on to the next step, which is calculate your market rates and calculate your weightings. Now let's quickly go on to weightings before I go into, um, into market rates and so on. When it comes to your weighting, your weighting in your WAC have to be your target capital structure. The weighting has to be your target capital structure. Now, in, um, in some cases, like for example, um, most uh, companies like Sessler and so forth, they would know what the target capital structure is. So in an exam, if they give you the target capital structure, meaning debt equity 60-40, then you use that as your weighting 60-40. In most cases, in an exam, they're not going to give you a target capital structure because that takes away from all the different calculations. They want to test the calculations. So they're not going to give you a target capital structure. So the question then is, how do we determine a target capital structure? So the general assumption is, the target capital structure is your current capital structure based on market values. And that is why we calculate market value. So I want you to understand what's the reason for calculating market values in a WAC calculation. The reason to calculate market value in a WAC calculation is to determine your target capital structure because it is your target capital structure that is used as you're waiting in a WAC calculation. Very important. So remember, it's basically, oh, sorry. Um, so there's basically um, two ways, your target capital structure or book values. Remember, we never use book values. The only time you use book values in your WAC calculation is the question specifically tells you to do so. But if the question does not tell you to do so, we never use book value, we always use market value. So just keep that in mind. Now let's move on to market rate and then we'll move on to market value, okay? So we'll move on to market rate and then we'll move, then we'll move on to market value. So let's go on to market rates. I'm gonna start off with ordinary share capital. The way we calculate market rate for ordinary share capital, there are three methods. As the thinking approach happens, works as follows. You ask yourself, has, has the market rate been given? If the answer is yes, we use the amount that is given. If the answer, which is in most cases, is no, then we have to calculate the market rate for ordinary share capital. The way we calculate the market rate for ordinary share capital is in one of three ways. In no particular order, one, 
it is used the cap M model, cap, capital asset pricing model. Number two, the dividend growth model. Number three, the bond yield plus risk premium. So those are the three options available to us to calculate the ordinary share, the market rate of ordinary share capital. Now remember, they're not, in most cases, they won't tell you which method you should use. So how do you know which method to use? The way you're going to know is basically knowing the formula of each method. And by knowing the formula, you will know which variables is required for a particular method. So when you read the scenario, you will be able to determine which method to apply. So for example, the capital asset pricing model, the formula is as follows, cost of equity or market rate equals the risk-free rate plus beta multiplied by the market rate minus the risk-free rate. So you know these three variables, the market rate, the, the risk-free rate and beta. So when you see those information in the scenario, that should tell you, you most likely have to use the cap M model. So what's important, when you, when you see a WAC question, when you have to calculate ordinary share capital, remind yourself that there are three methods for, and then run the, run the formula for each method through your mind and then try to attempt which method is applicable to the scenario. If you do that consistently, your brain is going to be able to pick this up automatically and hence you will be able to, um, when you read a scenario, you will be able to pick it up without even thinking. But if you're not going to do this type of thinking before the time, you're going to be thinking for the rest of your life. And you don't always want to think for the rest of your life because our, our brain doesn't have all that capacity. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So now we go on to calculate the debt and preference shares, calculate the market rate for debt and preference shares. The way you calculate the market rate for debt and preference shares is exactly the same. Okay, it's exactly, exactly the same. There are only two differences. Number one, the, um, the payment for, for debt is interest. The payment for equity or for preference shares is dividends. Okay, so that's the two differences. That's the one difference. The second difference is there's a tax deduction for debt because SARS allows a deduction for interest, while there is no tax deduction for preference shares because SARS does not allow a deduction for dividends paid. So just keep that in mind. Okay. So the thinking approach when you determine the market rate for debt and preference shares is as follows. You ask yourself, is it a redeemable instrument or a non-redeemable instrument? Remember, something is redeemable if there is a specified date of repayment. Something is non-redeemable if there's no specified date of repayment. This is very important because knowing whether it's redeemable or non-redeemable will drive which, um, which formula you need to apply. If the instrument is non-redeemable, that means there's, you're gonna, there's no repayment of the capital, then you must use the perpetuity formula. The perpetuity formula is market rate or I equals payment divided by market value. Remember the payment, if it's debt, it's interest. If it's preference shares, it is dividends. So that is the thinking level. If it is redeemable, there is a specified date of repayment, then we just use the financial calculator or you can use the cash flow format. The cash flow format is like, the, like capital budgeting. Okay, so just keep that in mind. I'm not going into the details now. We'll cover, we'll cover some of the details when we go through the question. And just to give you a high level overview as to how to think through a WAC calculation. Now we move on to market value. When it comes to market values, once again, you, are, you have to calculate the market value for ordinary share capital. So we'll start with ordinary share capital. It can either be given, or if it's not given, you have to calculate it. If you're going to calculate it, you basically have seven methods, but for WAC, there's two we always use, okay? So 
there's seven methods to get the market value of um, ordinary share capital, but all seven will be covered in valuations. The two, two out of the seven that get used in WAC is the dividend growth model or market capitalization method. Dividend growth model or market capitalization. Once again, how do you know which method? They'll either tell you which method to use or you have to figure it out based on the information that is given. For debt and preference shares, once again, we come to the same thing. Um, debt and preference shares calculated the same way. You, you follow the same thinking approach. Is it redeemable? Is it non-redeemable? If it is non-redeemable, you use the perpetuity formula. If it is redeemable, you use the financial calculator or you use um, the cash flow format. The cash flow format, like I said, is similar to capital budgeting. Now, as you would pick up over here, that the way you calculate the market rate and the market value for debt and preference shares is exactly the same thing. So what you should know, in a given question, either the market rate will be given and you will have to calculate the market value or the market value is given and you will have to calculate the market rate. This is for debt and preference shares now. So just be aware of that. Okay. So that's the basic theory I wanted to cover. To recap, I said we covered what is WAC. WAC is the cost of finance to a business over a long term period. It is the general um, uh, cost of finance. That's very important. It's the general cost of finance. Number two, we said why WAC is important because it gets used extensively in valuations. It gets used when making an investment decision, and it's also used in financial reporting. Then we said, how do we, we're going to deal with the meat. The meat of WAC is to calculate WAC. And how do we calculate WAC is, is as follows. That there are three things needed to, to determine the weighted average cost of capital. What is that? The components of capital, the market rate, and the market value. The components of capital is debt and equity. It is your, all your long-term interest-bearing debt, and it is all your equity. Your market rate, for ordinary share capital, you have the CAPI method, the dividend growth model, and the bond yield plus risk premium. For debt and preference shares, we calculate the same way, but you have to first determine whether it's redeemable or non-redeemable. For non-redeemable, we use a perpetuity formula. For redeemable, we use a financial calculator. Then for, um, for market values, for ordinary share capital, we use a market cap method or we use a dividend growth model. And then once again, for debt and preference shares, redeemable or non-redeemable, for non-redeemable perpetuity formula, for redeemable, we use the market, uh, we use the financial calculator. So that is a high level overview of WAC. If you can see that, then, you are quite far in understanding WAC. It will just now be to work through a question and make sure you can work through the nitty gritty detail. And then the next important part is to break down a complex scenario. But that's not the point of today's lesson. Before we move on to um, a question, um, do you have any questions that you want to ask me? Ryan, Danel, Faid, Akira Never, your first time, uh, Fakir, and then Lauren. That, am I correct in the, is that the right name? Any questions? Ryan, questions? No questions. No, questions. no, no nothing on my side. Fakir? Uh, no, all good. All good. No questions. I didn't hear you. You don't have questions. Don't have. Okay, Daniel, have any questions? Um, that Lauren. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so now we're going to go on to a. Um, now we're going to go on to doing a question. 
Um, I'm going to give you just five minutes to read the question. I'm going to share it on my screen. The question we're covering is MAC 3702, October, November 2020 final exam. Like I said, it is a third year question, but it is a good enough question for CTA as well. And that's why I chose it because the scenario is nice and short ish. And um, I didn't want to take a long scenario but it's covering all the fundamental principles that we need in order to make sure we can nail down any whack question. So I'm gonna share it now, and then I'm gonna tell you from where you must, from where until where you need to read. I'm just gonna give you five minutes. And then from there, I will read it with you and then we will cover it and I'll, and I'll do the calculation within Excel. So let me just share quickly. So this is, um, you should be able to see it. Can you see it? Yeah, you should be able to see it. Oh, not yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the scenario is um, this, Question, we will start by question two. You can just run through it quite quickly. There's not a lot of information over there, but I'm going to read it with you. I'm just going to give you five minutes to familiarize yourself. You just need to read this one page. I will read the rest with you afterwards. Yeah, I'm going to read the rest with you afterwards. So just read this one page I'm going to share with you now. I'll make it so you can see the entire page. So just read that, I'll give you about three, three to five minutes. Once you're done reading, then I will read it with you. Can we go through it now? Just give me a, just a yes, no, really. Okay, so I'm gonna take it, you guys are ready. So I'm gonna go through it now. So let's read through the question. Reading through a scenario plays a critical role in actually doing well in an exam. If you are reading simply just for reading's sake, as in to be for comfort, it's not going to do you that much good. So when you, um, within, within third year, within CTA, spend a bit of time to break down the scenario Go by paragraph by paragraph, see if there's something important or there's nothing important and so forth, 
okay? Then when you read the required again, go try to go back. Just try to practice to make sense of the scenario. You want to at least identify important issues within the scenario when you, during your reading time. And that takes practice. You're not going to get it overnight. So if you're going to practice a night before the time, it's not going to work. You need to practice continuously as you're doing, um, as you're working through the year. So to give you an idea of a way of reading, um, you just follow. I'll try to show you how to read, but also pay attention to how I read and what I pick up. I'll share it with you as I go through um, and then try to rip that when you start practicing because that's how you're going to improve on your exam technique that's how you're going to improve on finishing a paper um, by making sure you understand the scenario so let's get going they say smart farming group SF group is the largest agriculture company listed on the JSE SF's group Group's head office is located in the heart of the Limpopo province with 25 well-established farms all over Africa. The revenue stream is pr primarily from sheep and crops. The sheep enterprise produces high-quality lamb and wool, and crops production includes corn, wheat, and soybean. So in that paragraph, there's a few important things to, to take note of. Generally, this information will be useful in a, um, a strategy risk management type um, question, that paragraph. Okay, so I'm just pay, pay, pay careful attention. In the first sentence, they're telling you this company is listed on the JSE. Very important in management accounting to pick up whether the company is listed or not listed. It plays a role in valuations. Okay, it also plays a role in um, in strategy and risk management. So just keep that in mind. From an auditing perspective, whether you're listed or not listed also plays a, a role. So just keep that in mind to pick up whether the company's listed or not listed. They're telling you the company's head office is in, in Limpopo and they have 25 well-established farms. So that will be important from a strategy question. They're telling you there's two revenue streams, which is sheep and crops. And they're telling you that the, um, the sheep division um, produces lamb and wool, whereas the crop division produces corn, wheat, and soybean. Also from a strategy risk management type of question, that will play a role because um, for, from a risk perspective, from a growth perspective, um, you have to de determine whether the, the lamb and wool industry is um, doing well or not doing so well. Similarly, in the crop production, whether um, corn, wheat, and soybean. So like just a typical example would be, if you think about the crops production, you would know that um, not too long ago when, when the Western Cape was under, um, had a water so shortage, that plays a role. So although, although they have 25 throughout Africa, but let's say they had 25 just in the Western Cape, then you know that the um, water shortage in, in the Western Cape would have caused a problem. So you might just keep those type of things. How do you link? What's the importance of the revenue stream? How does that impact strategy? Because remember, a company makes money through revenue. So if revenue is impacted, then everything else will be impacted. So just keep that, be on the lookout for that on for a strategy and a risk management type question. For this WAC question, there's nothing important in that, in that first paragraph. Move on to the second paragraph. SF Group is a supplier to Carry Right Holdings, which is the largest food retailer across Africa. 65% of the revenue generated by SF Group is from Carry Right Holdings, and the remainder is from other food retailers. So there you can see that they supply the largest food retailer in Africa, okay? Um, and then 65% of the revenue generated through that retailer, and 35 would be from other retailers. Now, from a 
auditing perspective as well as from a management from a from a financial from a mac perspective um risk management over here 65% is quite a huge percentage so that is a concentration risk for this company because if um if carry right is the largest food retailer that means the buying power is quite strong okay so they have a high bargaining power and as a result they will have the power to decide who they want to bargain with and if um egg if, if this is a group can meet their price demands they could potentially easily move to another supplier so just keep that in mind 65% is quite huge so if you have a risk management question you would have to mention that that it is too big if you if you lose carry right you losing more than half of your business and then we have and then okay the rest is to other businesses so a paragraph once again paragraph 1 paragraph 2 more from a background of the company more information for a risk management strategy type question but nothing as yet for a um for a whack question third paragraph as at 31 march 2020 is if group groups share was trading at 96.50 the shareholders expect a dividend payout ratio of 9.25% for the period under review and the expected constant annual dividend growth rate is 8.25%. Now there's some information relating to WAC over here. We know it's a WAC question so we are looking out for information relating to WAC as you can see this information when we come to the end of the question you will see this information is right on top if you did not pay attention and if you did not read properly um by the time you answering the whack whack question you're so engrossed in the question that you may miss this information so just be on the lookout for these type of things because generally they group things together but this kind of general information they will they can put anywhere so please be on the lookout so this third paragraph there's a few in, in, i mean there, there's four important information over here number 1 they telling you as at 31 march 2020 in financial management when you deal with valuations when you deal with wac when you deal with capital budgeting you need a reference point you need a particular date that you are working with you can't work with no date because how are you going to present value so just keep that in mind you need a reference point when it comes to capital budgeting wac and valuations the reference point so far we're not yet sure we will see when we come to the to the required is 31 march 2020 so they're telling you at 31 march 2020 the share price was 96.50 you just take that sense divided by 100 it should be 96 and 50 um they're telling you what the payout ratio is it is 9.25 a payout a, a dividend payout ratio is as follows you take the um your earnings your total profit for the year your total earnings for the year multiplied by the dividend payout ratio and that will give you the total dividend amount so just be aware of that your dividends is equal to earnings multiplied by um dividend payout ratio that's the third important point the fourth important point is they're giving you a constant dividend growth rate of 8.25% so just be on the lookout we may have to use a dividend growth model somewhere in this question because we got quite a bit of information relating to dividends now let's move on So in Africa the chief operations officer of Esif Group recently embarked on developing a program that will transform the agriculture agricultural industry the program was designed to introduce effective information effective information access on how farmers can use a cell phone application to assess their productivity This initiative will hopefully increase the market value of the company shares by 3.5%. 
the program will require an initial investment of 30 million rand. So this, this paragraph doesn't really affect WAC. What it could affect is growth prospects. It could affect strategy and risk management again. And then it could affect capital budgeting. They're telling you require an initial investment of 30 million rand. When you're making a long-term investment, we fall into the um, domain of capital budgeting. We, we, we use NPV to determine whether a project is viable or not. So in that paragraph, it could be capital budgeting, but definitely it could be risk management and strategy. We're talking about an expansion, let's talk about innovation. So definitely growth prospects over there. Nick, but nothing for WAC, so that's fine. Now we go on to the next paragraph. Um, the COO started a series of communications with various stakeholders that will assist with the program, especially telecommunication institutions that specialize in coding. The company aims to secure new graduates to be part of its workforce. The development was released in a technology magazine and the company secretary has indicated to the COO that there are companies which are interested in partnering with SA Group in this new venture. Once again, strategy risk management, you can have a look at that. Nothing for, um, nothing for WAC. Next paragraph. Subsequently, the company announced that interested parties will have to submit the following. A brief business plan together with a five-year forecast, details on synergies that can be unlocked, latest audited financial statements, the submissions will be assessed, and only two companies which score favorably on the above will be considered for selection. Okay, so what you can pick up over here, this is a typical um, final exam type question, where generally the first page, the first half of the first page is background information, general information about the company, about its strategy, its growth prospects, its future things, um, and information regarding risk management, okay? So just keep that in mind. And then here and there, they will throw general financial information that may be used. So just be aware of that. In this one pager, we've got a nice background of what the company does, who they are, um, what, they, what, they, well, what their future plans are. Um, so we got that nice background and there was only some information that would help us in our WAC calculation, which was the, th the third par paragraph that deals with the share price, the payout ratio and the dividend growth rate. So just keep that in mind, okay. Now we're gonna move on to the next part of the question. I'm gonna run through this, this is financial statements. As you can see, the financial statement is as at 31 March, 2020. So we know that information in the first, on the first page will be very beneficial to us when we, because we most likely can do a WAC calculation as at 31 March, 2020. So here we have the financial position. We have 2019 and we also um, have 2020. So um, non-current assets, property, plant and equipment. We have investments, which is marketable securities and having tangible assets. Then we have current assets, biological assets, inventories, trade and other receivables, cash and cash equivalents. We're not so interested in assets when it comes to WAC. We are more interested in equity and liability. Because remember, in the WAC calculation, we need to identify our capital structure. Our capital structure is made up of debt and equity. So we are more interested in debt and equity. So under equity, they have a note number one, capital and reserves. Then under liabilities, under non-current liabilities, we have borrowings, which is that 25 uh, 25, um, uh, 25, 25 million, whatever that number is, 25,711. And then we have under current liability, short-term borrowings, trade and other payables. So that's it. What's very important, when it comes to WAC, we are looking for long-term finance, long-term interest-bearing debt, and all equity. 
So it's very important to look under current liabilities if there is any short-term finance relating to long-term loans. So just keep that in mind. Um, in this case, it doesn't seem so. So in this case, it looks like we only have capital and reserves under equity and we have borrowing. So we have to go look at note number one and note number two. Yeah, they're giving us the income statement. I'm not gonna go through that. We don't need that now. Um, then we have the following, the following information applies to 2020 and 2019. They're giving us an inflation rate we, we might need. They give us a prime interest rate we might need when it comes to the market rates in determining, um, for, for determining WAC. They're giving us the JIBAR 12 month rate. They're giving us a corporate tax rate and they're giving us operating days. Okay, now they say notes to the financial statements, note number one. This is what we're looking for, equity. The company has 500,000 authorized shares of which 60% has been issued. The share price is expected to increase by 4%, okay? Then we have um, ordinary shares, non-distributable reserves and retained earnings. So total equity is made up of three things, ordinary shares, non-distributable reserves and retained earnings. Okay, that's fine. Then we remember we're only interested in ordinary shares. Now we can look at note number two, we have borrowings. They say the borrowings are made up of the following, long-term loans, corporate bonds, and debentures. Under long-term loans, what do we have? SF Group obtained a loan for 17 million Rand from Land Bank on 1 April 2019 at an interest rate of 15%, and the interest, is, and the interest payment is made annually. The loan is secured by the company's property, plant, and equipment, and capital is payable on 31 March 2029. The interest rate on similar loans is at a prime interest rate less 50 basis points. What's important over here, remember when it comes to debt and preference shares, we know that we have to um, identify whether it is redeemable or non-redeemable. And then number two, be aware that either the market value is given or the market rate will be given. So one of it is given, you might just be able to figure it out. Now we go to corporate bonds. The 9.5% corporate bonds are currently considered part of the permanent capital structure and will mature on 31 March, 2027. They carry a pre-tax total interest expense of 590. Similar bonds are trading at 150 basis points above the prime rate. Once again, we need to determine whether it's redeemable or non-redeemable and then we need to determine which was given, um, what of the two was given, the market rate or the market value. Debentures, the 2.5 million debentures carry an interest rate of 7.35% will be redeemed on 31 March, 2026 at, at the time of redemption. SF Group will pay the redemption, the debenture holders an extra 80,000 Rand, which is deductible for tax purposes. The average going rate, the average going interest rate in the market of such debentures is estimated at 9.35% per annum before tax. Once again, debt and preference shares, we are focused on whether it's redeemable or non-redeemable. And then also what was given of the two, the market rate or the market value. Now I'm gonna go straight to the um, to the required. And number one says, calculate the weighted average cost of capital of SF Group Limited at 31 March 2020. So just keep in mind, at 31 March 2020, that is our reference point. So now I'm going to, I'm going to um, answer this question with you. And then you can ask me questions afterwards. I'm going to share Excel with, I'm going to share Excel with you now. Just tell me once you see Excel.
Can you see Excel? Yeah. Okay. So when you when you ask to calculate WAC, the first thing you do is write down the WAC formula. Okay. So WAC equals cost of equity multiplied by the value multiplied by the value of equity divided by the value of equity plus the value of debt. plus cost of debt multiplied by one minus the tax rate multiplied by the value of debt divided by the value of equity plus the value of debt. So the first thing you want to do is write down the WAC formula. That's the first thing that you want to do. But before we go on to the next thing, let me just really break down this formula for you. Remember, what do we need? We need three things. The components of capital. We need the market rate. And we need the weighting. Okay? So the market rate is the cost of equity and the cost of debt. So in the formula, the, um, the market rate is the cost of equity and the cost of debt. So that is the market rate. We said we need three things, um, um, components of capital, market rate, and weighting. Okay, so I, I spoke about the market rate. Now let's look at the weighting. The weighting is basically the value of equity divided by the total long-term finance, which is value of equity plus value of debt. Similarly, over here, the, the, the weighting of debt is the value of debt divided by the total market value of finance, which is value of equity plus value of debt. So just keep that in mind. Your weighting for equity is VE divided by total finance, and similarly, your weighting for debt is VD divided by total finance. Um, the, uh, the value of equity plus value in debt plus value of debt that is inside of brackets, that is your capital structure. That is your long-term financing. That is all your equity and your long-term interest-bearing debt. So just see how that makes sense. Just to clarify something further, you can see next to KD, there's one minus T, but next to KE, there's nothing. Remember, the cost of debt must be off the tax. Why? Because SARS allows for a deduction for interest payments. The cost of equity is not off the tax because SARS does not allow for a deduction for dividend payments. So if you can break down that formula and understand it, you will see you'll be able to remember that formula way easier. So once again, we need three things for WAC. Um, components of capital, market rate, market value. The um, components of capital, market rate, weighting. The, um, the market rate is the KE and the KD. The weighting is VE divided by total finance, and it is VD divided by total finance. Your components is what makes up VE, what makes up VD. So just keep that in mind. So when you when they say, dear student, please determine WAC, write down the WAC formula and leave a line to put the final answer in. Next thing you want to do is to set up your table. Your table will have basically um, four columns or five columns. It'll be cost um, components of capital, compo of capital 
it will be a market rate. And remember, after tax, it will be um, market values. We only use market value if the, if the target capital structure is not given. And then the market values will give you the weighting. And then we will get to whack. So stick to those basic, um, or the way of thinking, and it will potentially help you to actually navigate through a whack question seamlessly. Okay. So here we have our table. Okay, so the first thing that we want, so the first thing is write down the formula. Second thing, set up your table. Your table must have the three things, components of capital, market rates, and weighting. But remember, in most cases, in order to get the weighting, we need to calculate the weighting using market values. And that is why we have a column for market values. And then that will give us our WAC. Our WAC is simply, Our WAC is going to be market rate multiplied by weighting. So just keep that in mind. Market rate multiplied by weighting. Now, the first thing you want to do is put down your components of capital. Remember your components of capital? Debt and um long-term interest bearing debt, but you must list it on an instrument level. You can't just say debt and equity. You have to list it on an, in, on an instrument level. So under equity, we only have ordinary shares. Under debt, there, there's no preference shares. Under debt, we have long-term loan. We have um, corporate bonds and we have debentures. So like we said, the first thing you do, identify your components of capital. Um, your components of capital is all equity and your long-term interest bearing debt. You need to list each instrument making up equity and you need to list each instrument making up debt. Under debt, we have long-term loans, corporate bonds, debentures. Under equity, we only have ordinary shares. We don't take into account, um, we don't take into account non-distributable non reserves and retained earnings. The reason being is the market value of ordinary shares will factor all of that in. So just keep in mind, we don't take um, retail earnings and other reserves into account. We don't list it in our um, in our components of capital. Why? <clears throat> because the market value of ordinary shares will factor that in. So just be aware of that. <clears throat> Now let's go on to calculate the various numbers. So let's deal with market rates. Let's deal with market rates. And the ordinary shares, let's, we, want, we want to calculate the market rate for ordinary shares. The way of thinking would be, is it given? Yes or no? And the answer is no, the market rate for ordinary shares was not given. That means we need to calculate the market rate for ordinary shares. Now you tell yourself, okay, in order to calculate the market rate for ordinary shares, we have three methods. The three methods are CAPM, dividend growth model, and um, um, bond yield plus risk premium. Okay, so CAPM, 
dividend, um, dividend growth model and bond yield plus risk premium. Once you remind yourself of those methods, run the formula through um, run the formula through your head. So for example, I'm gonna go to the other sheet, I'll show you. So for market rates and ordinary share capital, ordinary shares, we have, um, what did I say now? Cap M, we have dividend growth model and we have bond yield plus risk premium. The CAPI model, we say cost of equity equals risk-free rate plus beta, I'm, I'm just using B for beta, um, minus, multiplied by um, uh, market rate minus risk-free rate. Very important to note, market rate minus the risk-free rate is equal to your risk premium. So RM minus RF is your risk premium. So you must pay careful attention when you read a scenario. For the dividend growth model, the cost of equity is equal to D1 divided by value today plus G. Keep in mind that is in brackets, G is separate, okay, plus G. And then for the bond yield, cost of equity equals bond yield, just basically the market interest rate plus risk premium. In this case, it will give you a risk premium. You won't be required to calculate a risk premium. The bond yield will just generally be like, um, a government bond, the long-term government bond, like the R102 or the R28, whatever it is. Okay, so that is that. So when you have ordinary shares, you tell yourself ordinary share, the market rate for ordinary shares can be calculated in three ways. CAPM, dividend growth model, bond yield plus risk premium. Then run the formula through your head for each of them. That will tell you what you need for each method and that will help you to, to pick up which method is applicable based on the information that is given. Now, if you recall, um, on the first page, they gave us information relating to dividends. So that is why we can use the dividend growth model to actually calculate the market rate. So I'm going to have over here working one. Remember, you have to reference your workings. If you don't reference your workings properly, you could lose marks easily. So just make sure you get your reference clearly. Another important point is, when you answer a question, answer a question with the answer. So as you can see, my, I have my, 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 my formula. Below my formula, I'm gonna put my final answer. Have the workings below your answer um, don't let the workings be the first thing the examiner see. Let your answer be the first thing the examiner see. Workings on a separate page, okay, after the question. So in, in this case, I'm doing my workings on a separate page. In this case, it's just below. So now I'm going to have working one over here. So I'm going to use the dividend growth model. For the dividend growth model, is that I, um, I can work out dividends, I have the growth rate, and I have my market value. Remember, I don't have a risk-free rate, I don't have a beta, um, I don't have a market rate. So I can't use um, CAPM 
they gave me information to, to they gave me dividends, they gave me growth rate for dividends, and they gave they gave me a market rate. So therefore, so therefore I can actually calculate market rate for ordinary shares using the dividend growth model. So I'm going to say cost of equity equals um, D1 divided by um, value today plus growth. So that's my formula. So I need my growth rate. I'm going to highlight this in green. That's what I want. In order to get that, I need D1, I need the value of equity, and I need the growth rate. Okay, if I go back to the scenario, if I go back to the scenario, um, I'm going to show you, I'm going to just switch quickly. So here I'm on the scenario. If I go back right to the top. Here is information I can use. Okay, so here's information that I can use. So I have um, a dividend growth rate of 8.25%. So if I go to Excel, I can put in 8.25%. I have the value today, 31 March 2020, of 9,650 cents. If I divide that by 100, it is 96.50. And then I have an expected dividend payout ratio of 9.25%. That is not my dividend, but dividend payout ratio. Remember, the payout ratio is a percentage of total earnings. So what I can do if I go to the income statement, the statement of profit, loss, and other comprehensive income, I take profit for the year, profit after tax, profit for the year of 3151. And I'll use that number to determine my, um, I'll use that number to determine my dividends. So now I'm gonna switch back to the Excel and then you can see what I'm doing over here. So, The value over here is equal to 9,650 cents divided by 100, which will give me 96.50, okay? The, the, the dividend, um, the constant dividend growth was 8.25%. That was given. And then they said the dividend that many that shareholders are expecting now, the dividend that Shell is, is, is expecting under this review is um, 9.25 of earnings. Okay, so the current dividends, the current dividends, D naught is equal to um the current dividends, which is D naught, is equal to profit multiplied by payout ratio. Remember profit after tax, okay? Payout ratio. That is equal to 3151 multiplied by 9.25%. So that is my dividends now, my current dividends. But I don't want current dividends. I want, I want dividends of next year. So remember, D1, the next period's dividends is the current dividends multiplied by one plus G. So all I'm going to do is I'm gonna say, D naught multiplied by one plus the growth rate. And that is my dividends of next year. 
what is very important to read in that question, they said shareholders expect a dividend payout ratio of 9.25% under the current review period. Now, payout ratio times profit, give me 2789. So that is 2789 for this period. But going forward, there's a, there's a growth rate of 8.25. So the dividends of next year is going to be 8.25 more than 8.25% more than the current period's dividends. So just be aware of that. Now I'll just plug in the formula. D1 divided by um, the value multiplied, oh, sorry, plus that. Uh, what's happening over here? Oh, wait, we made a mistake. I'll tell you now what the mistake is over here. So just keep uh, what, what the mistake over here is. Um, I'm trying to see something quickly. F19 plus one plus the growth rate, okay, that's fine. Oh yes, um, what we need to do obviously is that this 96 Rand 50 is a price per share. This is total dividends. So I obviously need to first change this up here. So let me just uh, show you well, what was the mistake over here. This 96 Rand 50 is a price per share. This dividend is total dividends. That doesn't make sense. I need to have um, dividend per share, price per share, or I must have total dividends, total um, total dividends, um, and total share um, market value. So I'm just going to convert this into um, dividend per share. So remember. The number of shares in issue is 500,000 uh, 500, multiplied by 60%. So just keep that in mind. The number of shares in issue is the authorized number of shares multiplied by the num um the 60 percent which is how much are in issue so just keep keep in mind that d1 and v must always be the same um in the same units if if you're working on a total dividends v naught must also be total market value if, if d1 is um dividend per share then v naught must be price per share so just keep that in mind okay so here we can see our cost of equity, a market rate is 8%, and that's basically how you would go about calculating it. Now we can work out the market rate for, um, ordinary, share, uh, for ordinary shares. Remember, I mean the market value. Remember to calculate the market value for ordinary shares. You, you, it's either given or you have to calculate it. It was not given, so we have to calculate the market value of ordinary shares. We are left with two methods, either the dividend growth model or the market capitalization method. You can't use the dividend growth model for market value 
because you have already used it for dividend growth model. So we, we, are, we are basically left with market capitalization and market capitalization is the method to apply because we are given the share price and we know the number of shares in issue. So working to, we're gonna do the market, market value for ordinary shares. So value equals number of shares in issue multiplied by share price. So here we're gonna have value We need number of shares in issue and we need the share price. We know the share price is 96 Rand 50. We calculated it above. We know the shape, the number of shares in issue is the 500,000 authorized shares and of that, 60% is in issue, so it is 300,000 so if I, I'm going to say number of shares in issue multiplied by uh, 96 and 50 will give me that 28,950. What I'm going to do is all numbers in this question is in rand thousands. So I'm just going to take that and divide it by 1000 just to be consistent because everything is in rand thousands. So you can decide what you want because all the, all the debt numbers are in rand thousands. I'm just going to keep the um, ordinary shares also in rand thousands. Remember you need to reference so that if something goes wrong, the examiner can go have a look at your answers. Okay. Okay, so now we can move on. So we dealt with ordinary shares. We dealt with the market value of ordinary shares, the market value of ordinary shares. Remember, to, um, for, for the market the rate for ordinary shares, there's no tax taken into account. So the before tax rate and the after tax rate is exactly the same because there's no tax deduction for dividends paid. Now we're going to deal with... <clears throat> um, we're going to deal with the market rates for debt. So I'm going to do it over here. Working three. Remember, <coughs> uh, when it comes to debt and preference shares, either the market value or the market rate will be given. If you, I don't know if you picked up, but basically in all three, the market rate was given. Not directly, you still need to do a, a basic calculation but to a large extent, the market rate was given for all three. How do you pick up a market rate? When they use the term um, similar, a similar rate, a similar instrument goes for this rate, then they're referring to the market rate. So if I switch back to the um, question, If we have a look over here, so remember prime interest is 9.25. So look at long-term loan, uh, um, in the last line, they said interest rate on a similar loan is at prime less 50 basis points. So that's similar, that is the market rate. If you look at corporate bonds, they say similar bonds are trading at 150 basis points above the prime rate. That is, your, um, that is your market rate. 
Then if you look at debentures, as they say the average going interest rate in the market for such debentures is estimated at 9.35% before tax. So they're giving us the rates. So we can basically calculate them. So working three for long-term loans, they, they said it was prime, so KD equals prime minus 50 basis points. Okay. So basically um, KD equals KD equals 9.25% minus 0.5%. To get the percentage for basis points, you just say whatever the basis points is divided by 100. So 50 divided by 100 gives you 0 0.5. So 0.5%. Okay. But we want KD of the tax. So therefore it's going to equal that multiplied by one minus 0 0.28. So I'm gonna go to market rate. So I'm going to go fetch it. Okay, so that is that. This is working three. So the answer over here is that working for the corporate bonds, it was prime plus working for it was KD equals prime um, plus 150 basis points. KD equals prime 9.25% plus 1.5%. Once again, the way you're going to get it is by, um, the way you're going to get it is by um, saying 150 divided by 100, which is 1.5%. So now we have KD of the Why? So Norris 9.35, isn't it? No, uh, it was for that um remember that the, it's prime plus prime is 9.25. The 9.35 is for debentures, which we're gonna do just now. So corporate bonds is that. Now we're going to come to debentures, which is under working five. So for working five debentures, they said that it's currently trading at 9.5, but before tax. Okay, so it's currently trading at 9.35. 9 9.35%. So after tax would simply be at 6.73. So that's our market rates after tax. So remember, market rate or market value will be given. Um, in this case, market rate was given for all three. 
that means we need to calculate the market value for all three. So let's get into that. Let's determine the market values. <clears throat> so let, I'm just gonna have a look quickly. I'm gonna share with you so you can see. So long-term loans. They say that if the group obtained a loan for 17 million rand from Land Bank on 1 April 2019 at an interest rate of 15%. That 15% is the coupon rate, the agreed upon rate, the rate to use to determine the payment. Okay, and the interest payment is made annually. This loan is secured by the company's property, plant and equipment, and the capital is, re is payable on 31 March, 2029. As you can see, um, as you can see, there's a specific date of repayment. So therefore, it is redeemable and therefore we use the financial calculator. So to use a financial calculator, let's have a look. We're calculating the market value. So therefore on the financial calculator, the market value is PV, so that's the unknown. That's what we're trying to calculate. So we need the other items. We need the future value. We need PMT, we need N, and we need I. Remember, the I must be exactly the same as the previous I. So just so you know, this is current market value. This is nominal, nominal value plus, um, plus or minus plus premium. Uh, could you show the um, the Excel again? Because I can't see the Excel. Oh, you're not an Excel. Uh, can you see it? No. Oh, there you go. Okay. Thank you. So PV is your current market value. Um, future value is nominal value plus premium or minus discount. Payment is um, nominal value multiplied by coupon rate in remaining payment periods, remaining number of payment periods and I market rate. Okay. Just some key points over here. Just some key points. Um, if payment after tax, then I then I must be after tax and vice versa. That's what you want to do. Okay. Another, give me some more points, one more point. Um, Future value and PMP must be in the same direction. Okay, that is both positive or both negative. You can decide. Okay, present value in the opposite direction. To future value. Very important, how's your number is not going to work out. Okay. So now let's have a look. I is um, working for. I is working for after tax. So we should stick with after tax. 
you can have it after before tax doesn't matter then payment is your nominal value our nominal value per the question was 17 million rand okay so it was 17 million i'm going to leave it in rand thousands okay so it's 17 million but i'm leaving it in rand thousands so therefore having 17000 multiplied by the coupon rate which is 15% now, because my I is after tax, I need to make my payment also after tax. So multiplied by 0 0.72. If I don't want a payment to be after tax, then I must make I before tax. Just make sure both payment and I is after tax or before tax. I'm just going with after tax. Okay, so it's nominal value 17 million. But I'm having I'm having it in the rand thousands, if I have 17,000 multiplied by 15%, which is a coupon rate, multiplied by 0 0.72, which is after tax. Okay, so it's equal to that. Then I have my, um, then I'm going to have, um, there's no, then I'm gonna have my future value that I'm gonna pay back the end of the term. So that is 17 million, one, two, three, it's in the rand thousands. So if I'm leaving it at, at that, then I have N. Then I'm having N. N is my remaining number of payment periods. What, the, what do I know? I'm paying it annually. So it's once a year. So it's one payment per year, multiplied by the number of remaining years. <clears throat> so I am in 2020. So the remaining payments is going to be 2021, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. So there's nine payments. Very important, not 10, nine payments. My remaining payments is starting from 2021, going till 2029. And it's one a year, so it's one times nine, which gives me nine. Now I'm going to calculate PV. In Excel, I'm going to say equal to PV. Open up bracket. They want the rate first. So there's the rate. Then they want N. There's N. Then they want um, PMT. There's PMT. Then they want future value. There's future value. Then they want type. Whether it's at the end of the period or the begin, beginning of the period, it's end. So therefore, and that will be, here we go. Like you see, it's in negative, but we expect it to be negative because it must be in the opposite direction of um, present value or future value. But you put in a positive number when you come to the WAC calculation. So under long-term loans, I'm going to say equal negative that and that is working six now i'm going to go to corporate bonds i'm going to share that thing again with you now So now I'm going to share this with you. Corporate bonds, they're saying um, a corporate bond are currently considered part of the permanent capital structure and will mature on 31 March 2027. They carry a pre-tax rate of uh, 590. Okay. Before we can do corporate bonds, we need to do the debentures. So I'll show that to you now. So um, the debentures... They're saying the debentures, the 2.5 million debentures carry an interest rate of 7.35% will be redeemed on 31 March 2026. Um, and at the redemption, time of redemption, a further 80,000 Rand will be paid. Okay, so now we can work that out. Once again, there is a, there's a specified date of re, repayment. So therefore, we will use the financial calculator.
So this is working seven. Let's change all of that. So the future value is the nominal value plus, um, plus a premium. So it's gonna be the 2.5 million, one, two, three, plus the 80,000, one, two, three. Because we have to make an 80,000 payment at the date of redemption, that's effectively like a premium. I'm gonna divide this by 1,000. The reason being is I'm converting everything into rand thousands. So that is 2580, okay? My payment is nominal value multiplied by um, multiplied by coupon rate. My nominal value is 2.5 million. One, two, one, two, three. But multiplied. please, sorry, man. We can't yes. see you, Excel. Oh, man. Can you see now? Can you see now? Yes. Okay, we just start over. So the future value over here, the future value over here is nominal value plus the premium of 80,000 rand. So it's equal to 2.5 million, one, two, three, 2.5, one, two, three, plus 80,000, one, two, three. I'm dividing it by 1,000 because we're working in rand thousands. So that is my future value. My payment is nominal value, 2.5 million, um, one, two, three, multiplied by um, the coupon rate of 7.35%. I'm going to check quickly if it is 7.35%, 7.35%. And then I'm going to multiply by the after tax rate, 0 0.72. Close the bracket, but remember, I want everything in the rand thousand, so I'm going to say divided by 1,000. Um, I is going to be working five in, yeah, working five. Let me just check. The benches, yes, so working five. Now I must get in. The repayment date is 31 March, 2026. So I'm saying 2021, 2022, 23, 24, 25, 26. So 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. So therefore it is six years. So that is my market value for um, debentures. So this year is equal to C53. Okay, but it must be negative. You want a positive number, and this year is working six. Now we're going to deal with sorry, not working six, working seven. Now we're going to deal with the corporate bonds. We're going to do the same thing with the corporate bonds. We're going to need this financial calculator information, plug it in over here. So I delete all of this. What we know is the following that the I is going to be working for, which is that in, if I swap over, So the corporate bonds, the 9.5% corporate bonds are currently considered part of the permanent capital structure and will mature on 31 March, 2027. They carry a pre-tax total interest expense of 590,000 Rand. So, okay, we are happy with that. So now I can go over here 
payment they are telling me is five hundred and ninety thousand rand. I'm going to say five. Um, so um, payment they are telling me is five hundred and ninety thousand rand. So five hundred and ninety divided by one thousand. I'm keeping everything in in rand thousands. Okay. Then um, in is th 31 March 20, in is 31 March 2027. So it's 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. So it is seven. Now my future value. My future value was not given. So the way I'm gonna have to calculate it is to rearrange the payment amount. Remember, payment, payment, equals nominal value multiplied by coupon rate, okay? Now, if I rearrange this equation, I can say nominal value, nominal, nominal value equals payment, divided by coupon rate, okay? So therefore, nominal value, um, PMT coupon. So the coupon rate before tax was given as 9.5%. The payment before tax was given 590,000 Rand. So therefore my nominal value is equal to that divided by that. So now I can just plug it in over here. This is equal to that, but I remember I wanted in rand thousand, so I'm gonna say divided by 1,000. So just keep in mind the nominal value was not given to you for debentures and we needed to use other information to get to the nominal value. So that's very important to note. Just keep in mind that the C's must be after tax. So I'm just going to multiply this after tax with my because my market rate is after tax. So now I can just take C59 and I can bring it in over here. This is equal to C59. Then there we go. This answer over here is working. This is working eight. So there we go. Now we can work out the weighting. The weighting is simply VE, market value of equity, divided by total finance. The market value of long-term loans is the value of long-term loans divided by the total finance and so forth. So now we can work out WAC. WAC would simply be A, which is the market rate, multiplied by B, which is the weighting. And if I do that for all of them, my WAC comes to 
So now that is my answer for WAC. Now I can answer the question and I can say, WAC is 7.42%. So that's basically an approach to tackle your um, WAC calculation. Step number one, write down the formula. Step number two, um, set out your, your, your table. Step number three, identify your components of capital. Step number four, determine your market rate or your market value. Step number five, if you determine your market rate, then determine your, your market value, your weightings. And that will give you your weighting, your, your WAC calculation. Remember, when it comes to ordinary share capital market rates, you have three methods. Market values, there's two methods. For debt and preference shares, first determine whether it's redeemable or non-redeemable. And then if it's non-redeemable, use your perpetuity calculator, your, your perpetuity formula. If it is redeemable, use your financial calculator. Keep in mind, either the market rate or the market value will be given for... Um, for, for debt and preference shares and other, the other one needs to be calculated. So as you can see, following those principles will help you to a large extent. There's just a few nitty-gritty things you'll have to pick up as you do different questions. For example, how did you get the dividend pay? How did you get the dividend amount? We had to use profit multiplied by the payout ratio. For um, corporate bonds, how did we get the nominal value? We had to rearrange the formula for payment to get to the nominal value. So it's those type of things you might just be on the lookout for. The third important thing over here was that numbers was in ran thousands. So some numbers was given in full, some numbers was given in millions. You needed to choose one method. I chose ran thousands because most of the numbers are in ran thousands and I converted all my numbers to ran thousands. So that is kind of the small ticket things you need to pick up as you're doing a question. So see the bigger picture, but then pick up those smaller issues as you do questions. Like I said, the smaller issues was that for corporate bonds, the nominal value was not given, and the way you had to get it was to rearrange the payments calculation. The dividend amount was not given, but you had to calculate the dividends for ordinary shares using a payout ratio. And then... Um, and then what's other thing? And then the, the, the unit of a unit measure the unit measurement that was in rand thousands. So those are kind of the, the things you needed to be on the lookout for. Then remember when it comes to the financial calculator, payment and I must always be both after tax or both before tax. You choose. And then payment and fair value, payment and future value must always be in the same direction. And then Future value and, and PV will be in the opposite direction. So just keep those kind of small things in mind. That's it from my side. I hope you found it beneficial. But before we call it a close, do you have any questions for me? No questions, but I'm going to send the Excel. Yeah. Ryan, do you have any questions? Yeah, also nothing on my side, yeah. Um, Akir? <laughs> Adria, you say? Uh, no questions from my side. Okay. Um, Lauren? Danelle, are you here? Yeah, yes. Yes. Um, and, uh, just, just, yeah, um, on the exam, question paper, and the exam, please. Thanks. I call you, you say? No, I just want, uh, wanted to also request if I could get sent the uh, exam and the exam. Okay, okay, I'll see the question paper, that's fine. Thanks, Rich. Thanks um, for your Lawrence, time. Any questions? Nothing. Okay, uh, no questions, then I'll send this through in the morning. Um, other than that, then we're done for the evening. Have a good evening, guys. Thanks for joining. I hope you found it beneficial. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you.